Hi, if you're just logging on, I want to welcome you to today's program. We're just going to take a moment and make sure everyone has an opportunity to log on. If you want to put a message in the chat, please feel free to do so. You can let us know where you're from, any thoughts on your mind, and the Q&A is where we're going to be asking you to put your questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you're just logging on now, um, we're just waiting for everyone to have a chance to log on. The chat is open if you want to put a message there to any of the panelists or to each other. And we will be asking you to put your questions in the Q&A button. Thank you. We'll be, we'll be starting shortly. Hi, if you're just logging on, we're going to give it one more minute, making sure everyone has an opportunity to get onto the webinar the, this afternoon. Thanks. All right, I think we will get started. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Judy Margles. I am the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I really want to welcome everyone to today's program from here, from there to here, understanding white nationalism. Our mission at the museum is to explore the legacy of the Jewish experience in Oregon, teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust, and provide opportunities for intercultural conversation. We challenge our visitors to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. I want to extend my gratitude to the Oregon Historical Society and to World Oregon for co-sponsoring today's program. These are both organizations with values closely aligned to our work, and I am forever grateful to partner with Eliza Canty Jones from the Historical Society and Tim DeRoche from World Oregon on programs that stretch and deepen our understanding of some of the most urgent issues facing us today. We offer all of our virtual programming, including today's event and recordings of past events without charge. We would be grateful for any donation that you may, might be able to make to help us or our partner organizations, the Oregon Historical Society and World Oregon. Today's subject is not an easy one, especially with the noise of the rallies that took place last Saturday across the country, the one in DC, of course, with the support of the current occupier of the White House. But I do feel it incumbent, sort of as a beginning to this conversation, to urge all of us right now, just cherish the fact that a biracial woman will soon be the vice president. American democracy may be under assault, but it is still holding. I was thinking about the title of today's program, Understanding White Nationalism, and how the dissemination of information is so different today from the first decades after the Second World War, when Holocaust remembrance was mostly silenced. Not many people wanted to know about the fate of the Jews of Europe, and survivors themselves wanting to rebuild their lives needed to forget. The recovery of fact and memory eventually replaced the silence but it took years. Our world today is radically different. The internet, for better and worse, make our response and reaction so much more immediate. The rise of white nationalism from the late 1980s, before the internet, to the present, where especially during this pandemic, it is our lifeline to engagement. It's a worthy study how this movement has moved from the fringes to the mainstream. Today's program also takes place under a long shadow, the 32nd anniversary of the murder of Malageta Sarah, a 27-year-old Ethiopian immigrant 
who was beaten to death by skinheads in Portland on November 13th, 1988. And of course, last week we learned about the death of white supremacist Tom Metzger, who was ordered by an Oregon jury in 1990 to pay $5 million in punitive damages for inciting these skinheads in the murder. We are so fortunate today to have with us three distinguished experts and colleagues who have been studying white nationalism for several decades. And I'll just introduce our three panelists. Leonard Zuskind is president of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights and the author of Blood and Politics, the History of White Nationalism from the Margins to the Mainstream. Leonard writes a regular column for Searchlight Magazine, has written articles and op-eds for the American Prospect, Rolling Stone, The Nation, The New York Times, and The Los Angeles Times, among many others. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation named him a fellow in 1998, one of its genius grants. He has received a number of awards, mostly, including most recently the NAACP, Kansas City, Missouri branch, Lucille H. Luford Special Achievement Award for his contribution to the community and the struggle for dignity and humanity for all persons. Leonard has worked for more than three decades to curb the influence of racism, anti-Semitism, and white supremacist groups in the United States. Eleanor Langer's book about the 1988 killing of Mulligata Seurat in Oregon, entitled 100 Little Hitlers, was chosen as a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Award for Work in Progress, and was also a finalist for both the Book of the Month Club's Best Nonfiction Book and the Penn USA Best Research-Based Nonfiction Book that year. A longstanding member of the Nation Editorial Board, she has appeared in such publications as the New York Review of Books, the New York Times Book Review, The Nation, Science, Mother Jones, and she's received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bunting Institute, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Open Society Institute. Ele Eleanor has taught at Goddard, Reed, Portland State University, and Pacific University. She is now at work on a portrait of the last ruler of the independent kingdom of Hawaii, Queen Lily Ukulani, combining her love of biography with her love of Hawaiian history. Steve Wasserstrom is the Mo and Isetta Tonkin Professor of Judaic Studies and the, and the Humanities at Reed College, where he has taught since 1987. He has lectured at universities throughout the United States, including Harvard, Chicago, Princeton, Stanford, and the University of California at Berkeley, as well as the major universities of Israel and Canada. Steve has been an invited fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, served as the Andrea and Charles Bronfman Distinguished Visiting Professor in Judaic Studies at the College of William and Mary, and as an invited scholar at the Center for Literature and Culture in Berlin. He has received numerous awards and fellowships and authored an additional a number of works, including Between Muslim and Jew, The Problem of Symbiosis Under Early Islam, Religion After Religion, Gershom Sholem, Mircha Eliade, and Henri Corban at Aranos, and The Fullness of Time, Poems by Gershom Sholem. That was, that was an extensive um, biography, but I really wanted you to know how, um, how expert our panelists really are. So to all of you in the audience, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I'm just gonna start, I really wanna welcome the three of you to today's program. And I'm just gonna give you each an opportunity, if you will, to reflect briefly on the trajectory of your own work um, with regards to white nationalism. So Leonard, I'll ask you to start um, first, talk up, give us sort of a big picture. Eleanor, if you would focus more on Portland and Steve, gonna have you bring us into the current day. So I'm gonna turn the um, mic over to Leonard. Thank you. Well, the white supremacist movement is a social movement. It's a political movement and it's based on ideas and ideology, not on emotions. That's why I stopped using the term hate groups because hate is a, an emotional term. These people are smart, they're middle class and working class and upper class, just like white America is generally. So uh, the, the white supremacist movement, the Klan and the citizens councils of the 60s were conservatives. That is, they were trying to defend something that existed, Jim Crow segregation. And uh, Jim Crow still existed in those days 
and they were trying to defend it and they were conservative, no matter how violent they were, and they were ter terribly violent and killed lots of people, um, they were conservative. When the white supremacist movement was reborn in the late and mid 70s, uh, they looked around and said, hey, this country's no longer ours. And they had a term that they used and it was based on books and stuff that they were reading. It's called dispossessed majority. They, they believed that they were a dispossessed majority. And, um, and therefore, they didn't want to conserve they wanted to overturn the status quo. So in a certain sense, they were revolutionaries. And they were revolutionaries who were intent on maintaining and building a, a, a white dominated society. About the beginning of the 90s, when uh, the uh, Soviet Union fell, and Germany reunited, and there were ethnic conflicts in Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia broke apart, and uh, there was ethnic nationalism and religious nationalism. I mean, what's the difference between a Serb and a Croat? One's a Catholic, and one's a, 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 a Orthodox Christian. And uh, the so it was religious nationalism. In the United States, it was racial nationalism that dominated their ideas. And they became nationalists in the sense that they wanted to overturn the society, but they didn't think they could win everybody in society. So they started talking about an, a small eth, white ethno state. And uh, that became their dominating idea. So when groups today get going, uh, they, they think of themselves as creating a whites only nation state on some land that used to be part of the United States. So they still wanna overturn it and they wanna create a whites only territory. So the white people can be the garbage collectors and uh, pick up the trash as well as anybody else. So that's, uh, that's the idea. They don't want Jews and Catholics and I mean Jews and well, they do want Catholics if they share their racial ideas. Uh, they don't want Jews and gay people and people of color in their whites only republic. And that's the long and the short of a short answer. I have, of course, a 700 page book, Blood and Politics, that it took me 15 years to write. And it has a more extensive answer and talks a great deal more about the transformation in 1990. So when nationalism um, became the dominant concept. So there you are. Thank you. We'll, we'll certainly have a chance to get further into it with, in conversation. So Eleanor, I'll turn the mic over to you. Um, okay, if I got unmuted successfully there. Um, uh, first of all, just let me say thanks to Judy and um, and the museum and the other sponsors for putting this panel together, um, as as and and to the other panelists. I mean, for Leonard, I wouldn't say I learned everything I know from Leonard, but I would say that I learned a good deal of it. Um, and Steve, I don't think I've ever had a conversation with Steve on any subject that I haven't learned a lot from. So thank you for getting us all together, Judy. And everybody out there I know has, uh, has their own thoughts and experiences on this subject. And I hope we'll be able to hear from some of you via Judy, via questions to Judy um, later. Um, but to get to Portland, I think Portland has a special relationship to this phenomenon, this movement that Leonard is talking about because one of the things that most brought it to the surface in the United States happened here, which, is, which was the killing of, of Mulligata Sarah on November 13th, 1988, which we're remembering with this occasion. And because another thing that was supposed to have responded to that event and somehow even atoned for it 
also happened here, which was the um, trial of California neo-Nazi leader Tom Metzger, now late uh, neo-Nazi leader Tom Metzger, um, by the Southern Poverty Law Center in October of 1990 for the Syrah killing. These headline-making events ensure that whenever white supremacy or white nationalism or even American racism in general um, are being discussed, Portland will be in one of the opening paragraphs. But they do not ensure that anyone trying to probe or oppose the rising tide of white nationalism with all of its sub-enemies, including, of course, Jews, will understand what happened here fully enough or deeply enough to help us stand in the way of the torrent which seems to be upon us. Um, the 15 years while Leonard was studying everything, I was um, immersed in these local events um, for my book. And I have an interpretation of them that differs from what is usually in those opening paragraphs. Um, and I want to describe briefly here the way I've seen these things um, in the hope it might help us um, fit Portland into the present situation more clearly, um, whether it will or not, we'll see. But first, I think it would be a great comfort it, uh, to us now to say that the horrendous killing of Muagata Sarah led to a collective soul searching about where the skinheads had come from and why. But in fact, the opposite happened. What there was was an outburst of historical denial. I personally will never forget Barbara Roberts, um, good-hearted um, as she was and is, uh, standing in front of the crowd at a protest that formed after Mulligata Sura was killed um, in, in Pioneer Square, saying, um, saying Racism is un-Oregonian, um, when as so many people now know, many more than did before, the, the opposite is true. Um, Oregon's racist history, um, founded on its, the Constitutional Exclusion Clause of 1859, exclusion of, of Blacks, um, is as solid as, any, as that of any other state or region in the country. Um, to say that racism was un-Oregonian, and many civic leaders said the same things, is in a sense not to take the skinheads seriously. Um, with, uh, with East Side White Pride, the, the skinhead, that the particular group out of which the skinheads who killed Sarah, the one they belonged to, um, with, with the, those skinheads defined as uh, as, as not us, as other, um, there, was, there was no way in which that terrible death would be used to look at Portland's racist history as a whole or at this worldwide reawakening with all of its complex sources that Leonard was just talking about. Um, it was more, we didn't, we, the rest of us didn't do it, we escaped. Um, we escaped blame. They killed, they pled guilty, they were in prison. End of story. But another obstacle to the possibility of learning what happened was the trial of Tom Metzger. A boon to the image of the city and to the fundraising of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, in my view, which is not a popular one, it further let Portland off the hook by ascribing the death of Mullah Geta Sarah and the grassroots movement it was part of to an outside agitator from California. This is not to say that Tom Metzger did not have enormous influence on the growth of the neo-Nazi movement. Um, what I, um, he did, but he did not have the specific connection to Sarah's death that the trial argued. And to say that he did further concealed the underground strength of the movement we are seeing growing now. Um, and it fed the illusion that something um, had been done about it, that something had been vanquished when in fact it had not. 
Um, there was also a freedom of speech issue underlying the prosecution, which um, in my also unpopular opinion, did not and does not do any of us any good. I personally was rarely more disheartened after my book was published than at a gathering of people here who um, I thought of as some of Portland's um, leading civil libertarians. I found that they did not care about the civil liberties aspect of the Metzger trial at all. Um, their attitude was Metzger was a bad guy and if you can get him off the streets, good. Um, they they rested resting that just quickly on on the argument that it was not a free speech case at all, which I've always believed it was, but a but a, something much more technical in the law and agency trial. Um, but there there was an, an a, there was an atmosphere of of success or 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 that vanquishing about the trial. Okay, we've we've taken care of it. Um, that clearly was not the case. Um, if putting Metzger out of business, which the Southern Poverty Law Center did, in fact, basically do, um, with all that ado that is reflected in the history books, um, and now also uh, carried forward by the headlines of, of Metzger's death, um, what accounts, what force, what really does account for all the things that we see happening now? what really were the uses and implications of the trial. So if we were in a classroom, I'd say, please, let's discuss, um, which we can't, but I hope that we'll, I, I hope we can think about it separately or together as we go on. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today and uh, it's a pleasure to be reunited with my colleagues from the work that we did on this in this area from the 80s and 90s in particular uh, and that uh, the distance we've traveled between then and now uh, is impetus behind the event for today so let me concentrate on the current event on current events on uh, the current day and the uh, d the distance that we have traveled um, let me do it as uh, succinctly as possible. In those days when we spoke publicly uh, at various venues of that, and synagogues and churches and uh, public uh, events, uh, forums, and we were asked how worried, that is by the public, how worried do we need to be about this problem in Portland? Um, it was hard to answer the, the question, partly because we didn't really have enough information we knew that there were threatening and dangerous elements, but in general, I would say that I, at least when I did it, I tended to say, no, we're not talking about a revolution. We're not talking about people overtaking the city. We're not talking about um, a mass problem in the way that people need to be um, alarmed. Um, we had a distinctive problem. David Irving, the most important Holocaust denier in the world, came multiple times to Portland. Um, and as Leonard said, that we were targeted as a kind of white, at the center of a white ethno state. So we did get a lot of, of uh, attention and attraction. Still, it didn't seem like it was a social situation that called for large scale alarm on the part of uh, people who are inquiring. The biggest difference I have to offer today, I regret to say is the answer now is yes. Um, and I've never, you know, I've worked along with my colleagues here uh, on this for many years and uh, it, uh, it's disturbing uh, to have to say that, but I, I will give you the reasons why I think that's the case. And that is to say that we have a qualitatively different situation now than we had then and that we should be alarmed. Um, and so let me just go through a, my reason, reasoning very quickly. Um, I agree that, uh, with Leonard that we're looking at a, a, a white nationalist uh, revolutionary movement, a social movement. It goes by various names. We have some who are explicitly revolutionary, like the so-called um, Boogaloo Boys, one of many groups who are interested in uh, overturning the government and in mass violence. Um, 
So I think that that in itself is a, a qualitative change. But let me give th uh, three or four specific reasons why I think um, things have changed um, for the worst. The first reason, um, to my mind, overwhelmingly is media. Now, when I say media, I mean all forms of media. And one of the biggest change, it seems to me, that's happened since uh, we were working on this in the 80s and 90s is that um, everything has been become digitalized. It's the key to everything in our lives. Electronic and global immediacy changes everything. And that includes these folks who possess communication power and media power on every level, social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Gab, et cetera. But it's much more than that. They communicate nationally in all kinds of ways that they couldn't back, back in the, the day. So they can converge on various cities from all parts of the country at the same time and coordinate marches. And that in, come in, in the violence, street violence, if you follow the street violence in Washington, DC this past weekend um, from the, um, particularly for the citizen um, journalists who are live streaming, you can hear them calling out battlefield coordination as they were terrorizing citizens, innocent citizens on the streets of Washington, DC. And they were connect, they were, they were coordinated by, um, by phones, but by many other means as well. This includes also surveillance of enemies online, coordination with mass media, on and on. So media has changed everything and it's empowered them enormously and they are very sophisticated in that regard. Second, convergence. Multiple groups which were largely um, separated are increasingly coordinated. So again, just to stick with the Portland scene, um, in the, in the, oh, since um, 2016, we have a series of uh, uh, so-called protests on the, on the waterfront and multiple groups, and I attended many of these, Multiple groups that sometimes call themselves um, Patriot Prayer or Pr Proud Boys and other uh, designations all mingled together. They're what, they were converging and they are increasingly, uh, these different, different formations and militias are increasingly uh, converging today. Um, my third point is mainstream support. We have, they now, many of these groups have, are connected, well connected. Uh, to extreme right-wing politicians throughout the country on the state, local, and national level. Um, and obviously that's an enormous difference. Um, there's a question of funding, which is a matter of research that we all need to dig into. How did thousands of Proud Boys come to Washington, D.C., um, be put up in hotels, um, co coordinate a whole event of that kind, there is funding, and I'm not saying anything conspiratorial, it's just we could learn a lot more about um, that change, which is how, they get, how they're being funded as well. I'll point to one thing that, that um, connects all these things together, that is my points about media convergence, uh, mainstream support and funding, and that is finally internationalization. So we know that groups here are connected to European groups, both uh, Eastern and Western movements. Uh, and they look to them for publicity, for inspiration, for strategy, and for funding. Um, one of the most chilling uh, examples of internationalization are the mass shooter manifestos. So we've had ma uh, racist mass shooters here in Europe, uh, in New Zealand, and they have increasingly, when they've uh, perpetrated these monstrous events, have, have written sometimes eloquent so-called manifestos in which they refer to other, these other groups. So we know that among other things, these, these massacres, uh, racist massacres that have been perpetrated um, are all aware of each other. And all this is, uh, what I'm saying now is all, we have documentation for all of this. Um, I think I probably have you alarmed enough, so I'll stop there. All right, wow. Anybody have a joke? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I'd like to add I, one thing here, Steve. Sure, and then I have a question for you, Leonard. Um, the, uh, one of the signs of the massification of the phenomenon is what's happened with uh, a group that we called Amen's Army in the Institute for Research and Education Report, uh, IREHR.org. Uh, we published a report about a group that was a couple of dozen Yokel Schmokels 
in March and is over 20,000 today. And that's a quick, rapid conglomeration of forces. That's happening all over in every indication. Also, uh, Judy, I'm no longer the president. I founded the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights in 1983. I've been at this for more than 40 years. I'm no longer president. <laughs> Burkhardt is doing a hell of a good job as president of it. And the next time you do one of these things, get him. He's smarter than I am now. And he's young. No, we wanted you. And actually, Leonard, while, while you're unmuted, so you, you said in your opening remarks that you wouldn't call white nationalists hate, hate groups. And I heard you say um, last week when we were talking that you also wouldn't use the word fascism or mm -hmm. fascist. Uh, there are so many labels and terminology that all of you have sort of referenced and we've got more that weren't spoken today, neo-Nazis, right-wing extremists, alt-right, white power activists, ethno-nationalists. So Leonard, do you wanna just dig into that and why not hate groups? Why not use the word fascist? Well, uh, let me just begin with neo-Nazi. I okay. only use the term neo-Nazi for those that are wearing swastika pins. There are many more who have the national socialist ideology who are uh, un, un, uh, unadorned with the pins and the flags. And I actually worry about them more. And so I call them national socialist groups. I do not think, I think that we get confused and disoriented by our own language sometimes. When we call something a hate group, we think that they're just demented. We should call in some psychiatrists and get them fixed up. And you can't do it that way. It's an ideological phenomenon. And they're ideas, and we have to defeat the ideas as well as defeat the movement. Now, I think one of the, there's a lot of discussion of fascism, and there's a lot of anti-fascist groups that are just fine and dandy. But I don't like to use the term for one simple reason. It, it, um, fascism is a system of a strong state. And Amos is anti-state. The militias, which are growing like crazy right now, are anti-state. They wouldn't have to have a big state with a lot of authoritarianism to be able to get rid of the Jews and the people of color, shoot us all down. But um, uh, right now, they don't have a, a movement of movement-wide agreement on the concept of a strong state. So they don't have a movement-wide agreement that they're all fascists. And a lot, there's a lot of false consciousness in that movement. So they're wrong about a lot of things. So, uh, and also let me just add, I fought with my editors about the term national socialists. I did not capitalize it in the book. I, you know, when you write communist, you don't nationally, you don't naturally comp, uh, capitalize it unless you're members of the Communist Party or some <laughs> communist group. Same thing with national socialists. It's an ideology. Got it. Eleanor, Eleanor, Steve. And they, they, they and there's Farrar, Strauss, and Drew, which is no, not a chicken liver group. And uh, eventually they agreed with me. Got it. So I would, I would, uh, oh yeah, I would take exception to s just one thing that Leonard said is I don't think we need to defeat their ideas. You might be right there. There's a miscellaneous and complex rainbow of ideologies. I think we're past that point. First of all, we learned that lesson from dealing with Holocaust deniers. They wanted us to quote defeat their ideas. They didn't have any ideas. They wanted to to perpetrate a a monstrous lie. The folks who are showing up in our streets now, I, I've been to many of the events, they're not interested in talking. They're interested in violence. I think um, it's, it's, a, it's misplaced to think that we can go out there and debate with them. You go out and debate with them, they're, they're gonna <laughs> perpetrate. No, but there are the that, that do have ideas, Steve. And so I'm not just referring to the ones on the street in Portland. I'm referring to the ones that are putting up thoughtful websites they're as thoughtful as anything that goes on on the left. They just have wrong ideas. And we have to defeat those ideas. 
not it's not the only thing we have to defeat the movement but we have to know those ideas and defeat them and be able to explain why it's necessary to defeat them to the people on the ordinary people on the street so um i mean it 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 does sort of lead to the question from for the three of you and any one of you can go first but is is it a mainstream movement? I mean, is there, do we still think of them as fringe or are they really in the mainstream? And mm -hmm. Leonard, you said again last week when we were planning that 101 far right um, people were elected in, la in the last election, right? We have that you, tra or you tracked 101 candidates in the last election running for office. That, yeah, that's, that's incredible, 101. Yep. And some of them, how many? Two, two were elected, right? That we know, you know, we know their views well enough. Um, I think it's both not mainstream and mainstream. They've they've noodled their way into the mainstream, and we'll see what happens when uh, Biden is the president. And what happens to their ideas? I think that there might be a, uh, the militias pick up and commit more violence. Because uh, the avenues of politics are not are not as wide open, but we'll see. But certainly, they have a toe or a foot in the mainstream, and they have influence in the mainstream that's way beyond their size. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, Steve? Do you have anything? I, to I want to tell like, um, I I vanished from my own screen, but I don't suppose that makes any difference to anybody. We see you. But yeah, okay. Um, uh, these are two different aspects of things that that um, Leonard has just said on on the question of ideology the, or ideas. I was constantly asked after I had spent time with all the members of Eastside White Pride, what did they have in common? It's this. People are always looking, and professional people too, are always looking for the psychological or socioeconomic bases of of these ideas. And it, um, honestly, these however many years ago, thirty two years ago now, those those skinheads in Eastside White Pride were attracted by the ideas. I mean, they weren't theoreticians. They weren't, uh, you know, they. Well, they they weren't intellectuals, but but it was the ideas that they had in common, and no nobody liked to hear that. The other thing, this is just a point of difference that goes. One of the things I didn't learn from Leonard, one of the few things I didn't learn from Leonard, was an was an old argument about um, the use of the term neo-Nazi. For 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 whatever it's worth for other people thinking through it, my. My argument for the term neo-Nazi is maybe simplistic, but that anything that's post-Nazi that raises those ideas is neo-Nazi. And the reason that it's useful to use the term is because it contains what the threat, what the ultimate threat and what, and what the promise, it, uh, as it were, of, the, um, of that term is. So I still I still use it and I'm comfortable with it. I un, I understand I understand the arguments against it, but but to me the term still makes sense. Can, I, can we throw in a question for for Leonard or Steve when you both when you if you can get to it? If fa if fascism is the wrong term for the reasons Leonard has just so lucidly outlined, what what about Antifa. What a, what a, yeah. How can you, how can you fix that one? If, if, uh, if fascism is the wrong term, where, where are we? Uh, Leonard, you're muted. Unmute. I can't, I can't unmute him. He has he to unmute himself. himself. I can't hear him, Judy. No, he is, he has to unmute. There he goes. Uh, okay. He's good. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, it's not, pronounced like Donald Trump does. It's Antifa. Sorry. <laughs> and everybody, well, everybody's doing the Donald Trump pronunciation. It's Antifa. And I like all the Antifa groups. 
they're all a little bit crazy sometimes, and so have I. I've been a, a little bit crazy, um, but I think that they're good groups. Sometimes they don't know what the hell they're doing, but a lot of times they do. And uh, um, I've worked with uh, the Antifa at the beginning of its curve in Minneapolis. The individuals, they were anarchists and they were young. They were ashamed when one of them was 21. They thought they were too old. <laughs> it was all news to me. And, uh, um, I like them. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to work with them because they're just too crazy on violence. But hey. Judy, I was t I, the, my question to, to Leonard was about the terminology. Is it if if the fascists aren't the right enemy, is Antifa the right name, the right label? And and actually, that I'm I'm glad you asked that, Eleanor, because you're mimicking a, a, a few questions from the chat that are um, asking about Antifa as well and how we relate to them. So, okay. Steve, do you have any anything to offer? Uh, just that Antifa is a, is a highly heterogeneous and highly miscellaneous um, phenomenon. It's a kind of an ideology. It's not a group. There's no joining. It's not coordinated. Many of them are, are to the anarchist side of things, so they're, they're not coordinated even. So to, it's, a, it's a mistake. There may be a very broad umbrella in which we can use that term usefully, but um, they represent all kinds of protest and resistant movements, resistance movements. So for example, here in Portland, when we've had night, many nights of, um, of street action, uh, they, um, while Antifa got most of the attention, there were lots of other people who were protesting for lots of ideological reasons in addition to, in addition to them. It's useful, useful to, the, to the powers that be to send in FET, federal force, for example, to have a name and mm -hmm. black clad enemies to identify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, I, I was reading actually this morning that um, the FBI uh, released a report indicating that anti-Semitic hate crimes had increased, they said 14% in 2019. And the, the um, report I was reading suggested that that, um, that number was um, highly undercounting the actual number of hate crimes. So, um, you know, that is there and we know that. But I do want to sort of maybe push us to something, if there's anything positive, and Eleanor, maybe you're the right one to take this first. But, you know, thinking as change, you mentioned Barbara Roberts, of course, uh, you know, talking about there's no racism in Oregon, but looking at the time that Mulligator Seurat was murdered and the public attitude after his murder and looking at it today, mm -hmm. I guess, specifically in Portland. And then, you know, of course, we've got this movement for racial justice that has just boomed since George Floyd's death. So you want to just reflect a little bit um, since the reception of your book to today and, and where we are? Yeah, I, I think it's very important um, not not the not the book, but the change that um, that that there's been a great accretion of knowledge and spread of knowledge about uh, white the history of white supremacy in Oregon, the history of racism in Oregon, um, as well as nationally, uh, obviously um, that we. But if you, I I doubt if there was an article about uh, about the protests, about the downtown protests about in, in Portland that didn't start off with Oregon racial history. And, and that is an enormous change. And certainly, I mean, and, and actually truly progress. So, so there is very little similarity, at least at that level, between the response to the killing of Sarah and the killing of George Floyd. So that's one piece of good news. It is. And, and Leonard, do you want to reflect nationally or globally? Sort of, you know, in, in your long and esteemed work on this subject, the, the changes that you're noticing with public attitudes. 
Well, I think the major phenomenon today in terms of the public uh, attitudes are is the polarization. We're polarized now geographically, politically, racially, and along idea lines, ideologically, politically. Um, we're all polarized and there's very little common ground. And so uh, when I first went to uh, work for the National Anti-Klan Network in 1984-85, um, in um, my boss, Lynn Wells said, we're working towards the middle. And she was from the left. I was from the left. We were all from the left, but we were working towards the middle. And uh, we did a pretty good job of it, but there's no middle anymore. And, uh, and you know, the Republican Party doesn't have a middle. And uh, we're in a very different situation. It's polarized. It's difficult. It's it's harder to find friends on the other side of the street, and but we've got to do it. But uh, it's more difficult today, in a certain sense, than it would have been when I first started out in the Midwest. We were doing trainings for well, I wasn't first starting out, but when I was younger, much younger, we did trainings for farmers and clergy in the Midwest because of the comatatus. We trained 2,000 farm leaders and rural clergy between uh, Colorado and Ohio and North Dakota and North Dakota and Texas. It's a lot of folks in a lot of small counties. And it'd be much harder to do that today to draw people in because they're more polarized. And if, if they're lined up Republican Party, they're not going to talk to somebody from the other side of the street. So that's the dominant thing I think that we have to face. And how much does an so look at where this polarization comes from? But that's another story for another time. Or, or maybe if I could just push a little bit, and this is a, a question that that has been asked, and Eleanor, I think you alluded to it too. So, where what is the role of um, economic inequality? With, where is that role in the rise of white nationalism? Or maybe is there a, is, does it play a role? Um, Any of you? Anybody could. else? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I studied this Leonard. question and it's discussed in detail in my book and I don't think there's been a change on this. The concept that they feel is racial dispossession and that can be middle class white people, working class white people. It's not primarily a working class phenomenon. It's not a lower class phenomenon. The skinheads are not lumping proletariats. They're uh, middle, sometimes middle class people with middle class jobs. And um, economics do not play a role except that they contribute to a general crisis like the one today which makes the whole thing much more difficult. But it's not economics that draws these people. And if you want to look at, look, I, the two places I looked was the California vote on immigration reform. And there's, a, there's lots of studies of it. And they found that it was racial uh, uh, fear of black people and brown people. And it was uh, a concern about the status of the state finances, but not their personal finances, which were just fine, thank you. Hmm. And in Louisiana, Duke drew, David Duke, the Nazi Klan leader, and I use the term Nazi advisedly, um, uh, the Nazi Klan leader, David Duke, he drew a majority of the white vote, 54%. And it wasn't all working class, middle class people. I voted for that Schmigigi Brainy. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, if I can ask Steve a question then, I, I mean, and Steve, I've, do you think that white supremacy, the ideology of white supremacy can burn out? Is it gonna burn itself out? Is it, um, and this is a, oh, a question from the Q&A, is it uh, you know, the last gasp of, of a dying ideology um, or is it so entrenched? into white America that it will always be with us. 
you know, did, speaking to the kind of uh, emergency and alarm that I was highlighting, uh, I am not one of those people who reverts to uh, the the metaphor or the the precedent of the of Germany in the 1930s. I don't I don't I don't think that we're looking at incipient authoritarianism or genocide or something apocalyptic. No, I do think that these movements though, and, and, and we have good reason to think this are getting better, or as I suggested, better coordinated, better organized, better funded. They have momentum and um, we would be as a society foolish not to, um, to take them very seriously as a threat. They're not going away in my opinion. Leonard, do you have anything to add? Let me say something. Or Eleanor. Eleanor oh, I just wanted to say um, one of the things you realize if you do read Leonard's book is, um, or maybe otherwise, is that is, is the long history and density of, of, the, of this kind of thinking, however, however we define it exactly. And I, I'm, I'm afraid that when we, when we look at Trump's followers and we, we think that they're all just being whipped up now by him or whatever the categories are in the press that the, his followers are usually discussed at now, it ignores this enormous base of, of this web of uh, thought and um, relationship and, and the history that, that, it, that it is also coming out of. In other words, it's not, it's not just a contemporary phenomenon, it's this very long standing phenomenon that Leonard's documented better than anybody ever had or ever will again. And I think that that has some, that has some bearing on the question you just asked Steve. I mean, does it, does something like that go? It, 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 it's not a flash in the pan, it's, it's very substantial. And it's, uh, I, I don't know what, that's another base that, that that's that's an invisible, maybe sedate base of Trump, that not that still people don't really know about very much, and we know what's in front of us, but we don't know what's underneath us. Can I speak to this? Please. Could, yeah, yeah. I agree with uh, what Eleanor just said. I just want to point out that there are now books on how American white supremacists thought in the teens and the 20s and the 30s contributed to Hitler's thoughts. Yeah. yeah. We didn't invent it all. Mm -hmm. We invented it. We invented white supremacy in the United States. We lived with slavery. We lived with living. Okay. With, and that's, that's, that stuff is not going away. Not fast, not easy, but okay. maybe we will get rid of it, God, God willing. Uh, but it's going to be a long fight. It's going to go on longer than me, and it's going to reach a climax around 2042 when white people become a minority in a nation of minorities. These groups are going to go berserk, and I'm not sure white people, the majority of white people or people of color are ready for this crazy stuff that's going to go. It's going to make Trump look like he's nothing. And uh, we got a we got a battle in front of us, and there's no way of getting away from it. Yep, I agree. I agree, and that was the, the point I was making as well. We've I got, agree with Steve. We need to we need to mobilize. We need to organize. We need to understand these ideologies and these movements, and we need to do it sooner rather than later. So, Steve, while while you're while you're on the screen and you know Eleanor mentioned free speech as being a an issue with the Metzger trial and we're all seeing the role of social media as it's um, with us and, and never go, going to go away. Uh, is social media, can it be used to our advantage moving forward? Is there a way to bring social media and help be, people 
get more from the fringe back into the center, whichever fringe, I guess, but. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I'm somewhat of an amateur in this regard, but I, my, my sense of it is that social media, media more generally, are the universe we swim in now. So uh, depending on how we use them, they can be that we're, everybody needs media, not just social media, all other forms of communications media. That's really, we're in a mediated society now. And so um, certainly as much as they use them, we also need to use them to push back. Um, we do need to think about how specifically social media, specifically Facebook and Twitter, for example, are being used by these groups and abused by those. That's an immediate threat. And, um, but that's a larger political conversation. Oh, Carol, what happened? Leonard, do you wanna, do you have anything to uh, suggest, Eleanor or Leonard? Just the, the role that, the, the, is there a, a better role for social media? And if there is, how do, how do we get us there? And how does that pertain to free speech? Right now we can read in social media, unbelievably um, horrendous things are being put out there. And where does free speech play into this? Well, what I think about, can you hear me? We can, yes. When we I think about it. It free speech is, not so much the free speech of the other team, but our free speech and we should use it. And uh, um, and uh, all right, you can yeah. see. My, we, you're you're good. We're, you're good. We'll see. My you. screen went googie baga. <laughs> um. Well, so anyway, I think it's the, when I was on a panel for the New York State uh, Attorney General uh, did a panel on this topic last January before the, you know, before the COVID really hit. hit. And, uh, and there was a bunch of this discussion about the First Amendment this and the First Amendment that, and can they have it and can't they have it? I say, let's get one thing clear. We have the First Amendment right to speak out about this and we should speak out about it when people wanna know what's the most effective route everywhere. Use websites, use books, use pamphlets, use, chatter boxes and uh, all the media stuff and use television, radio and every damn thing you can, including leaflets on the street and, and get out the message. This is wrong, it's gotta be stopped. We have to understand it in order to stop it. Let's get smart and get this done. Can I just follow up on that quickly? I, feel, I, I agree very strongly. Um, I, and one, uh, some, a contributor to the chat said, what would it look like to be ready? And I, what Len, Leonard just said, I agree with everything. We need to do everything. We need to get many more bodies on the streets. We need to get many more people educated and particularly organized. The groups we're talking about now are rapidly organizing with increasing funding and communication and political support. And we need to do all of those things because we do have a battle on our hands. And I think we have to get our heads around uh, how serious that is. Some folks are saying we're, 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 uh, we shouldn't just be um, pessimistic, and, but we need, there are things we can do. And, and Leonard just named a bunch of them. We, we, can, we should use every means at our disposal in short. And I'd like to add something here. Am I, am I can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah. I've been, there's, there's nothing like old fashioned conversation between two people. And I think it, it's all, it's right, obviously, that, that all, all the media and whatever that's av available sh should be used by us as well as them. But I've, I've, I suddenly felt this during the campaign um, that our side did not acknowledge, does, it still doesn't know how much in, in a bubble we also are. I mean, there's, there's this bubble and that bubble and we're, we're also in one. Maybe there's some cracking of that now because of the lack of the blue wave, because of the absence of the expected blue wave, which was kind of a 
product of the, uh, an imaginary product of the bubble. But I think it is so hard for people, for any of us, and I mean, certainly it's hard, hard for me personally to even want to bring up a conversation with somebody who I know holds, holds these views you know, a whole, these being a whole range of views that I think are frightening or abhorrent. But it, it, besides what, besides what we do collectively, we really have to do things in, individually. You know, I mean, maybe I'm not making myself clear, but, but probably not. Um, and can you suggest some ac actions? I mean, it, I was a just pandemic, suggesting, we I was suggesting talking to people, talking, I was suggesting talking to each other, fi finding, finding common ground, just, you know, which is going to be a, an endless cliche in the period coming up. And yet, it really does have, have to be done. It's not dramatic, but it's, I don't know, don't, don't ask me how to do it. <laughs> During a pandemic. <laughs> Even not during a pandemic. It's, it's hard. We believe what we believe and we're, we care about what we care about. And we're Leonard, did you? Yeah. Leonard, did you want to follow up? No, I agree. Yeah. I agree with all this. Yeah. We just, and we have to talk face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I hate the fact that we're all confined in our houses because of this. Uh, and one of the things I might say to Judy is read my book because I <laughs> the history of Holocaust denial in that book sure. from A to Z, sure. including all the fights that they had with each other. So, Judy, if you yeah. come over to my house, I can loan you a copy. Oh, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, I do want to just take a quick pause. It, 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 we're, we're just a little after the one o'clock hour. Um, there are still a lot of questions, a lot of people still on the program. If you have to leave, I want to thank you for joining. We will just keep it going a few minutes longer just to get to some more of your questions, okay? And I, I am looking at a question. There's been a couple of questions from people sort of really trying to understand. It's back to the labels and the terminology, but you've got, um, you've got white nationalism movements, you've got white, white supremacy, which is part of our culture in general. And can you sort of help us understand sort of the parallels and the differences between the two? I'll throw it out to whoever wants to take the question. Um, can you hear me? We can. The thing that we have to, what I, for me works is, um, this is a white supremacist society. But it's not the same white supremacist society that it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've elected mm -hmm. um, a black person to be president. That's a huge change. We have black people. Now we're going to have a, a black and an Indian woman that's, that's uh, going to be vice president. We've made changes. We've elected people from the South who are uh, dark skinned to Congress. That's a huge change. It's not the change, but it's a huge change. The thing is that you have to understand is that the white nationalist and white supremacist movements have their own ideas about this. They don't have our ideas about this. Mm -hmm. And they, they believe that they've been dispossessed. And when you ask them, well, how did you get dispossessed? They say the Jews did it because the black people aren't smart enough to beat us. And they say, the Jews beat us. And so we have to topple the Jews too. And that goes, you know, there's a billion of the, the, you, that's in the conversation. Um, that's how anti-Semitism enters this movement. Um, we've got a lot of work to do and we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't stop anything. I'll, let me just jump in here and say, uh, I, and I'm looking at the chat, there are a number of folks who have expressed uh, uh, questions along these lines about how, how should we engage them? On what level should we have, have a, as a conversation about ideas or about ideology and try and quote, understand them and build so-called shared ground? And my answer is we're in a, largely in a world increasingly dominated by conspiracy theories. And if there's yeah. one thing we learned struggling against Holocaust denial is you do not debate with Holocaust deniers. They want you to debate with them because it legitimates their, and, and 
heightens their profile. And if somebody uh, espouses QAnon or Holocaust denial or anti-vaxxing or any other um, uh, non-rational belief system, I'm not sure how, how or why you should try and engage with them. There's no, there's no really, not a lot of rational overlap. We uh, will not convince these people through discussion. Yeah. We will convince them by the strength of our movements and the discussion that swirls out of these. While I agree with Eleanor, there's a lot of one-to-one -one discussions that have to happen. The main way the, that the, and look, I brought people out of the Aryan nations. I brought them out of the Ku Klux Klan. I've done my share of that business. But what's got to happen is larger, bigger groups have to be on the table and putting out ideas. And I agree with Steve, we've got to leave their ideas off in the dust. And we have to build a stronger social movement. Um, build a stronger social so, movement. And you know, we're a bunch of old people who don't like to get out in the streets anymore. <laughs> Steve so, does. <laughs> yeah, except for Steve. <laughs> some of, um, you know, some of this, I think a, a question we haven't touched on is, is the funding. I mean, these, these, they seem to have a lot of money and is there you know how does money play into the success of these movements and is there a way that is part of the work we can be doing is to try and defund um well we did uh, let, let me just say we're talking about lots of heterogeneous groups right. i believe that the answer is i'm not a specialist in this particular area but i think the answer is we don't know we don't know about the funding, but there is a lot of there is a lot of money that's obviously going into buying uh, arsenals and communication systems and travel, and um, it would help to know where all that money is coming from. Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, it's coming from them. They're soft the funding. There's no big funders. There's a few big funders in this thing. I remember when when uh, the 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 uh, Tea Party movements started, and all the folks out of uh, on the coast they said, "Oh, this is a uh, this is a uh, fake grassroots." And they said, "All the money is coming from the Koch brothers in Kansas to run this thing." Koch brothers had their own organization; they didn't have a Tea Party organization. And talking about the Koch brothers being the funders of the Tea Parties missed the point. They got they had their own contributions. And they're middle class people who can make their own contributions. And uh, if you have a couple of guns, it's not that expensive. Well, it's more expensive than it used to be, but you know, there are a lot of them are old like us. And uh, you know, $200 for an AR-14. Um, uh, back in the day, $300 for a 30-30 for a lever action. I do agree that, that the Nazis are essentially uh, self-funded. However, the, many of these groups, including, for example, the Proud Boys, have been running con uh, candidates for office around the country. And that's the, he the head of the Proud Boys now ran, ran for uh, Congress in Florida, I think it was. That took a lot more funding than self-funding. So there is a coordinated effort to raise money uh, among, among some of them towards larger ends, including elective office. I think that's more than self-funding. Yeah. And David Duke ran, when David Duke ran, he ran on a couple hundred, uh, ran on a couple million dollars in three years. He ran statewide, he ran, raised a lot of money and they weren't all clean. And uh, yeah, they have support. Oh, oh yeah. Yes, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, wasn't, I thought I might be off of this. Sheldon Adelson is not a funder of this phenomenon. He's a funder of Trump, but not of this stuff. He's dumb, but he ain't that dumb. I think one, one of the quite Judy, am I on? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry if I interrupted Lenny. Leonard. You're, you're good. No, I'm um, done. Um, one of the questions that's running through this conversation that we haven't probably clarified at all <laughs> probably is what is what is and what will be the relationship of this movement however we what however inclusive we make it or whatever we call it to 
electoral politics. We've talked about um, moving, how it's moved from the center to the, to the mainstream. And you asked, you, you asked that question, but the, the medium, so to speak, of the, of the mainstream is electoral politics. And I, I certainly don't have any answers. I, I, I do have questions. I also have a, just a very brief quote that I want to read that it came, it, um, before, before I wrote my book, I had written a, a special issue of The Nation called The American Neo-Nazi Movement Today. This is before the Metzger trial. But I'd done a lot of reading in German history, as I guess we, we all have. And I, you know, I, I grasp Steve's point that it's not, you know, they're, they're not the same. But one of the things that really stuck in my mind was this, uh, the historian George Mossy, whom a lot of you both on the, the panel and out there probably are, are familiar with, with his work. But he, wanted, but he said, um, in 1930 in Germany, the left and the center had to argue on the terrain occupied by the racist right, one of the Nazis' principal victories before seizing power. And not to say that there is an analogy, but to say, look at this discussion. Look, look at the things that we're talking about and that we have to talk about, that we didn't have to talk about. Um, that, or, or different from the subjects we were talking about 50 years ago or even 25 years ago. Um, that's not necessarily a victory before seizing power, but it's a tremendous victory. And that is a, that's a, that's a gloomy note. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but, but that has always stuck in my mind. Um, well, I, I think we're getting ready to wrap up. I will just ask one more question. Someone did uh, pose a um, a question to all of you, if I brought you back again, would you be willing to do this again with a white supremacist in dialogue? I'm not even sure I'd want to hold that program, to be honest with you, but it's a question that someone is asking. I got kind of used to talking to them when I was working on my book. It would depend on the person. Yeah. It, it really would. And that's yeah. that's another thing, just th throw in that... that um, the, the absolute the absolute writing off of of all white supremacists as as non non human beings not talkable to is 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 not a good reading of who people are there's a lot of variety so my answer is it would depend on who it was leonard thank you no no you're, you wouldn't do it <laughs> too much other stuff to do <laughs> no steve I, are you agree no I agree with Huh, interesting. But I mean, what about our point? We have to talk to the other. Sally had a suggestion from somebody who we know is. I was in 87. One, you know, I was early in the morning in New York, stayed in a nice hotel, blah, blah, blah. Didn't get anything done anywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, so, my answer so would still be yes. <laughs> All right, but it, well, depends, it also depends right. on what you want to talk right. to them about. Right. If you want right. if you would talk right. to them about why they think what they think, right. so you might learn something. It's always a danger. You might, might actually learn something. But but wouldn't that just give them the attention they want? Free pub, free advertising. If we know they're already violent and anti-democratic, what what are, what is there to talk about? I don't understand. Right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose the violent one, Steve. I'm much too chicken for that. What about even anti -democratic ones? If they're anti-democratic, how much conversation can there be? We'd have to try it and see. We'd have to, we'd have to see. It's been tried. So, I know, so I've tried it a lot myself. But. Well, let, let's just, you know, we, we called the panel um, from there to hear. Um, I think it's, it's really useful to have all of you reflect a little bit about where we can go. How can we, you know, how can we offset the message of these extreme groups going forward? I think you've all offered something to that, but maybe just give each of you just a minute or two, just to sort of summarize how we can, how we can push forward 
um, given kind of the gloom and doom that you have presented to us today. So Eleanor, I'll start with you. Oh, you can start with me, but I would rather defer to, okay. Leonard, to Leonard and Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Leonard, you're on. Well, I think the first thing that you have to do is know the opposition. And so you have to study it a little bit and you study the website, study the IREHR websites and there's other websites and look at the Antifa websites and see how they're discussed and learn a little bit about the, uh, the opposition. Um, learn a lot about the opposition. Learn where they're going and they're going over population. And then if we're smart, we'll get the, together something that saves the 14th Amendment, defend the 14th Amendment, because there's a lot of people out there who want to get rid of it. Birthright citizenship and equality before the law. And, uh, and uh, the second thing is politically, I would begin by unelecting the congressmen who have signed on to uh, resolutions to get rid of legislation that didn't pass mm -hmm. the legislation uh, to get rid of the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship. There's about a, two dozen of them now, or sometimes there's more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say, get rid of those guys and you'll do us all a favor by delegitimizing that idea. And then I'd say, get the kids ready. Not so much what we got to do, what we got to teach um, the next generations to come. So if we get them ready, they'll do it. They'll take Thank care. Thank you. Well, Steve, you're in the classroom. What do you have to say? Uh, I do say that co college age students do see this differently and um, that they don't have the, the kind of uh, uh, history that we have. I hesitate to add up the ages of the three of us. Uh, but um, yeah, we represent the old, old guard. And things, and if I can just emphasize this point, things have changed enormously and very, very quickly. That's characteristic of our time. And uh, th that's what we need to think about using media means today and young people who, are, who know how to use it um, and as soon as possible, because things are moving very quickly. Thank you. Uh, a, a great discussion. Really appreciate it. We're getting a lot of requests in the chat to bring you back again for a second discussion. So keep thank stay you. tuned to everyone. Um, thank you, Leonard Zuskin, Eleanor Langer, Steve Wasserstrom, for really sharing your expertise and your insights. We got a lot of work to do. Um, but thank together you, we can do it. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks everyone out there for participating. We will be sending you um, the chat. People like to see the chat. So um, our wonderful IT person. Thank you, Amber Kerson, who once again uh, handled all the technology with uh, um, seamlessly. So we'll be sending you an email. The event has been recorded. You'll get a recording and a copy of the chat. So thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody.